Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Do you want us to uh, mute? Uh, it's up to you. I don't, I'm not too worried about it. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity to lead Bible study. And I feel like I have very big shoes to fill following Basil. <laughs> um, but I'm grateful that I could watch him lead us for so long. I definitely learned a lot about pacing and taking your time to just dwell in the word. And um, so I'm excited to jump into this with you guys. Um, what I am going to do differently is bring music into this, um, since that's my day job <laughs> and my expertise. And I recorded you know, all those hymns, all 720 during the pandemic. So my thought was to find hymns that were partially inspired by passages that we're going to be reading each time. And I'll play them and uh, pull up the text. And what's neat about having the recordings is that you get all four parts if it's four-part harmony instead of just I me mean, playing one part on my violin. Um, so that's kind of how I'm going to do my own spin on it. And we can see if we like it or don't. I'm flexible with how things are going. Um, but I love that we're starting with James. Uh, he's a half brother of Jesus, which I didn't know. Um, and then we're ending with Jude, who's another half brother of Jesus. Although I thought that was kind of neat that their book ended there together. Um, so James and the rest of these through Jude are known as the general letters in the sense that they are not written for any one specific church or any one specific people. Um, so they're often referred to as the general letters at the end of the Bible. And they're mostly written for Syrian Jewish Hi. Christian. Hi, did Hi. you hear my text? Yes, I did. Okay, are you starting to drink liquids? Yes, I am. Hey, wonderful. I'll pick up about 11.50. Yes. Okay. No, see you then. Okay. There's a way to mute. Hi, Patsy. Hi. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. We were just talking. I was just introducing James to the group. Um, uh, they think this was written AD 50 to 62-ish, and um, that it was written for the Jewish Christian agricultural workers around that time. And it's got three big themes, uh, trials in Christian life, wisdom, and riches and poverty. And it's inspired by the Sermon on the Mount. So, you know, the whole Jesus's golden rule. And also there's a lot of um, Proverbs in there because Proverbs one through nine talks a lot about wisdom and you know, warns about temptations and such. And so it's interesting to see where he pulled his inspiration from. And he knew Jesus, which is really awesome. So anyway, I love the... Um, Bible project videos that Catherine shows us sometimes. So I was going to play just a little bit of it and we maybe play a little bit of it each time that relates to what we're going through. Um, can you see this okay? Yes. And just speak up if it's too loud or not loud enough. No sound. Oh, you can't hear it? No. No. Oh, oh dude. Let's see. Well, that might be above my pay grade of how to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it wouldn't share sound. Well, that. Oops. That might not work for the hymns either then. Well, that's something I can work on for next time. Um, it basically goes through some of the history. I could maybe turn on the closed captions. Okay. Can you see those? Yes. Okay. Well, if you don't mind reading. Oh, that's fine.
So then he goes on to talk about the other chapters. Oh, but we'll save that for next time and hopefully I can figure out the audio situation. But I thought that was a really great intro and background. And, um, if you have a short attention span, I like the drawings. <laughs> <laughs> the, the response of those people to his teachings that, you know, whoa, ouch, and dang. <laughs> That was yeah. really funny. <laughs> yeah. Bible study can be fun, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, let we can get started on James 1. Can someone read 1 to 11 for me? Uh, Susan, go for it. Okay. And this is the... Uh... Oxford Annotated Bible Revised Standard Version. <clears throat> James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greeting. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all men generously and without reproaching, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, will receive anything from the Lord." Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Thank you. So kind of my first thought is that he addresses everyone as my brothers and sisters. I think that's a really inclusive thing that I really appreciate. And he does it about 15 times and it's really consistent. So I thought that was neat. Um, and then the themes that they were talking about in the video, you can see where they pulled them. Uh, in verse two, he's talking about the trials. You face trials. And then um, wisdom in verse five. Yeah, if any of you lacks wisdom. And then the third theme is riches and poverty, which you can see in verse 10. It talks about the rich taking pride. Um, so does anyone have any responses or different translations or thoughts they want to share about this? I like the imagery of the wave upon the sand as being um, kind of not in control of your own direction. Yeah. And, you know, I start to understand reading this, you know, why being a deacon is so much about knowing the gospels because there's so much social justice information in these texts. And it seems to be a real core theme. Um, and I think it's neat that there's a holy order within the church that that's their focus is the gospels. I think that's really cool. Anyway, um, can we, let's just continue. Can someone read 12 to 17 for us? Go ahead, Steve. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one stood the test and will receive the crown of life that, is, that the Lord has pro promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, which is fully, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what caught my attention? Like, oh, go ahead. These are kind of like one-liners, like the uh, yeah. narrator was saying. Um, yeah. Easy, easy to quote. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. What caught my attention was uh, the crown of life and just trying to figure out, you know, what does that mean? Um, so I have the New International Version Study Bible, and they were saying that the Greek word that was used is actually refers to a wreath that was placed on the head of a victorious athlete or military leader. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Crown of life, like, is that eternal life? Or I just thought it was interesting. And then when we get to Peter later on, he talks about um, the crown of glory as a reward. And so there's these different crowns throughout. I thought it was interesting that they all kind of use that term. And there's other places in the Bible where it gets mentioned too. I forget what they are right now, but <laughs> um, I, and then I verse say something. Um, Go ahead. Sometimes those crowns, like after somebody has won a, a race or something, mm -hmm. the crown is made out of bay leaves. So yeah. that's we we still have bay leaves to this day. So they use in cooking. Yeah, Diane. I have a footnote that says on, in verse twelve, the crown refers to the victor's laurel wreath. Rather right. than royal diadem. Oh, that's a bay laurel tree. It's yeah. a bay laurel tree. That's no. it made me realize yeah. that was a connection. That's really cool. I have um, a cross reference into Timothy, which mm -hmm. um, in Timothy it says, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, yep. the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Yep. Yeah, it's in Timothy, James, Peter. It's in Matthew. Yeah. It's kind of a neat thing that connects them all. And no, then, I, you know, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I seem to remember my mother and maybe other people of that generation saying, you will certainly be rewarded with stars in your crown. And I have no idea if that's from this or what exactly that means, but there's another crown reference. It sounds like you've you've earned something or you get to be shine or glorify. I remember in kindergarten, if you're good, you got to lead class out to recess and they put this star, you know, this lick and stick star on your <laughs> forehead so you could lead the, <laughs> lead the class out. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting Funny. things that come up in just in reading this. Oh, oh my gosh. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> I um, I have a different Bible, and so it doesn't mention the crown at all. No, this what's it say? The, the, the New English Bible. So it says, um, oh, I've got to find it again now. Um, for having passed that test, he will receive for his prize the gift of life promised to those who love God. So the crown is the gift of life, yeah. But it doesn't ever say the crown. Funny. Yeah, and then there's the crown of thorns on the other side, right? So, you know, maybe it's a reference to changing what was a very painful thing into something positive. Yeah. Or it might be a reference to um, winning over temptation and sin. You know, you're the yeah. victor over over that temptation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then in verse 16, there's that brothers and sisters again. Does is, does everyone have brothers and sisters in all the translations? You guys have no. what do you have? No. Just my brothers. friends. My friends. You love it. You love it. Dear brother, brethren. I have my brethren. Beloved. My I have my friends. Brethren, yeah. Yeah. Beloved's cool. I like that. I think that his um metaphor or whatever here, when this is fabulous, starting in verse 15, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is mm -hmm. accomplished, it brings forth death. I mean, you can you can see that mm -hmm. the way yeah. he, he describes that. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's also about that he was leading the very first Christian church after Peter left Jerusalem. And so birth is kind of regeneration as well. And he talks about first, first fruits. And so the 
These are the first fruits of the crop of the Christian church. And they indicate that there will be many more crops, hopefully, that will eventually come and be regenerate and be born again. So, yeah, it's he's really good at imagery. That's for sure. Um, and then verse 17 is really, I, I found that there were a lot of hymns that were inspired by verse 17. Um, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. This is the light coming down. See it in a lot of hymn texts. Um, and I don't know I, if I can't share sound. Um, I mean, I can try to see if this hymn will play, but maybe if I'm not sharing my screen. Um, but the first hymn I was going to talk about is hymn 423. Do you hear that? No. No. Okay. All right. It's probably some setting that I have to figure out. <laughs> I've here. heard that it's a YouTube thing, that it's difficult to share YouTube because it, it's got some kind of a system so that a lot of sound doesn't interfere with uh, with a presentation i don't know if you can override it in youtube but i think well this is a file that i downloaded oh so it's um, not youtube this time oh uh, yeah. no okay so we got the words anyway um but yeah i will pull up the words Let me share this technology is fun okay which hand is this 423. Yeah. Oh, well, I think it's just a good reminder of that verse. Every good and perfect thing is from above. Yeah. Which is totally. sometimes not given the credit that. Uh, yeah. You, uh, you think it's good luck or, you know, whatever word you want to use to describe mm -hmm. what happens to it, but not from the, from the Lord from heaven. Yeah. And so can you see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So verse three was the one I thought was the most inspired by verses 11 and 17. Um, to all life thou givest to both great and small in all life thou livest the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree and wither and perish, but not changes thee. And so, um, I think it was 11 was talking about blossoms falling and beauties destroyed. And anyway, to show that I'm not making this up, <laughs> they have a tab, uh, scripture references, and there's a lot. Um, but you can go down and see James 1, 9 to 27 is an inspiration for this text. Oh. Um. Yeah, so I'm sorry can, this sound isn't working, but I'll next figure it out for next time. Um, we can move this. So the and I was going to show one more hymn right now that's also based on verse 17, and I thought the refrain. So remember, verse 17 is the light coming down from God. And the refrain is, all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, for all your love. Yeah. So hopefully next so time. Which, which hymn was that second one? Um, 291. Okay. Thank we you. plow the fields and scatter. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. So let's keep going. Um, can someone read 19 to 27? 17. 
that don't? The 19 to 27. Okay. Go for it. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the world and word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. Let me finish it. Or... Um, is that through 27? That was through 25. Yeah, just go to 27. Okay. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Oops. That's heavy stuff. <laughs> How, what are your reactions to that? A lot of current politics. Mm -hmm. The other um, thing, isn't it in sort of contrast to something Paul was saying? Yeah. You're saved by grace alone, not by your acts. That's Paul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So isn't that uh, kind of going against the fact of grace, stating that you need to do the, the good works. I think the to... good works stem from your grace is kind of how I was seeing it. You have the love in your heart. I think it, it depends on how you interpret perfect law from verse 25. I think that's referring to the golden rule of loving your neighbor as yourself and mm -hmm. I feel grace stems from that and good deeds follow is how I was looking at it. That's what I've always thought, but this sounds like it's blaming people if they don't if they don't do the good works. Yeah. I really like uh, verse 22 of be doers of the word and not merely hearers. It's so easy just to sit in the church service and enjoy it and say, oh yeah, that's great stuff and, and all, but mm -hmm. if you don't do anything with it, Kind of wasting the effort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you didn't yeah. get it then because if you got it, you'd do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's crystal clear with his definition on religion that it's that very, at the end, to look after orphans and widows and their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You know, that's, you know, I feel like that could apply to a lot of different religions. So, yeah. yeah. What struck me about that was the, the statement, everyone must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That is a very good thing to keep in mind. Yeah, that's a pretty famous passage, I would say, from there. Yeah. I like his reasoning there, too, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. So... Anger is not a useful um, response in this case. Yeah. No. Yeah. Because they're, you know, I've definitely heard preachers that sound angry before, and yeah. it's kind of a big turn off. Yeah. You're like, yeah. okay. Well, yeah. I, I mean, a lot I'm, of people doing social justice do it out of a cause of anger, and ultimately that leads to burnout and you know, separation from the, the cause mm -hmm. that you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. You really have to be careful about that. Yeah. Yeah, 
I mean, he's saying that anger is not the answer on one hand, and then he's very clear about the way things should be on the other. So it's kind of a tight rope to walk there. But I found him 312 uh, was inspired by this section. So it's about service, strengthen for service, Lord, the hands that holy things have taken. Let ears that now have heard thy songs to clamor never waken. I think it was just the first verse that I was reading. Yeah, but just the call to service, because that's clearly what this section is about. It's kind of interesting. But it's it's undergirded by the holy things. So there mm -hmm. has been that hearing and that acceptance that then leads to action. Mm -hmm. It does and talk about tongues. Yeah. And it, it, on the second verse, it says, Lord's made the tongues, which holy yeah. saying keep free from all deceiving. Yeah. And hmm. but ears that now have heard thy songs to clamor never waken. So it's like you're you're becoming deaf to the world. That's kind of how I interpret that. Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, James is mm -hmm. pretty clear about what he thinks we should be doing like it's simple everyone it's so simple <laughs> I thought what was interesting about that song is it was written in the year 307 mm -hmm. <laughs> a long time ago yeah the hymnal is really a portal in time that's for sure yeah and just you know of course we know that hymns are based on the Bible, but to really see where the inspiration comes from right in front of you is really interesting, I think. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on the first chapter? Well, I, I'm thinking about the, you know, breaking down that camp or the camps in the city. Mm -hmm. And yep. it's like, I got two bedrooms that no one sleeps in, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm not going to move on it. Right. It's easier to give money mm -hmm. or to buy socks. Yeah. Or to fill my car with a banana or apples and hand it. Yeah. It's pretty hard. But you're not alone. I mean, you're part of a beloved community that does good works too. And, you know, that's where you can jump in and help and be part of something bigger than yourself. I think that's why church is important because like, we can't figure out these problems on our own. We I have to do it together. I think yeah. the old loaves and fishes when we were at Holy Rosary was serving that population that's in all these encampments. Mm -hmm. I agree. We have a speaker from Avenues for Youth coming on Sunday for coffee hour. And they specifically help homeless youth and just um, there's a lot of young people that don't have homes, like either their parents kicked them out because they didn't like who they were or they just couldn't afford to provide a home for them. And it's it'll be interesting to learn about how they help and what we can do to help them help. So, yeah. I think the only way we live into our faith is finding ways to do it together. That's well said. And that last verse 27, it's visiting pure religion, visiting orphans and widows in their distress. To me, that means that was probably the most vulnerable population in that time that had no recourse, nobody to look after them. And that could be um, anybody in our culture that's cast aside on the margins really needs yep. uh, somebody to notice them, like mm -hmm. the homeless encampment people, mentally ill. Yeah. Yeah. And again, to tie it in to the diaconate that I'm learning about, you know, deacon can mean servant, but it can also mean someone who brings relief and 
can see here how that ties in. It's like you need someone in the church, like helping go out in the community and figure out what it needs and bridging the church outwards and making sure that we are doers of our faith. Well, should we go on to chapter two? Okay. Let's see if someone could read one to 13, that would be great. I can do that. Go for it. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with, uh, with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please. Well, to the other one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who oppress you. It is, it is not they who drag you into court. Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convinced convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable to all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, you also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So, so speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mm -hmm. Is that what you want me to read? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Ooh. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It really is. This is a lot like Proverbs, very much like Proverbs, but mm -hmm. stretched out a little bit more. Yeah, you can see it for sure. Yeah. Um, what I thought was interesting, in my translation, it says, this is verse two, suppose a man comes into your meeting, and I was like, well, I don't know, what do they mean by meeting? Like, do they mean a religious meeting? Do they mean some other community gathering? Um. And the study Bible I was looking at was saying it could mean, you know, a gathering at a synagogue, but it could also mean a trial or some kind of legal meeting. And so if you came in dressed as a poor person, you were immediately at a disadvantage for whatever was going to go on in that legal proceeding. And um, so it, they think that you might have been trying to call on that favoritism that happens kind of naturally just based on people's clothes. Um even in a court setting. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and then the royal law, I thought that was another interesting phrase that popped out to me. That's verse eight. If you really keep the royal law and earlier he referred to it as the perfect law. And I think they're the same thing, the golden rule. Um, and I believe the reference to royal law is that it's it's referencing the kingdom of God, and so that's why it would be royal. Um, but he seems so consistent on everything else. I thought it was interesting that he uses different references for the same golden rule. Um, that's kind of where Jesus is shifting the dynamic on the whole messianic laws because you know, he said the one that really matters is love your neighbor as yourself. 
So it's just a big shift. And then, uh, what else is I thinking? Oh, I just love the very last one-liner. Again, mercy triumphs over judgment. So like the whole chapter is judgment, judgment, judgment. And it's like, oh, but mercy triumphs over judgment. Um, so I kind of naturally cling to that last line of, you know, mercy is, you know, where you're going to be able to, it's like grace. It's how you're going to be able to do these good acts. And um, hopefully you will find mercy at the end if you're doing your good acts and living with the faith in your heart and that the mercy will triumph over judgment. Um, is, does that mean that God will show you mercy or does that mean that you should be merciful to others? I mean, that's it was kind of ambiguous there. Yeah, I think it's both. It could be both or, you know, either one or both. Yeah. Well, and the law, to, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, show mercy to other people and then God will be merciful to you. Mm -hmm. Judgment day. Or flip it around. If you didn't show mercy to other people, you're not going to get it when you need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and then he talks about the law that gives freedom. And I think, you know, it's he keeps oversimplifying, but maybe in a good way that you're either with sin in your heart or you're not. And mm -hmm. so I think it's easy to get sucked into well, I sort of messed that up, but it's okay. And so he's just really laying it out there as one extreme or the other. And that's a lot to think about and kind of ingest that you're either holy with God or you're struggling to get there. And that, you know, maybe it is all or nothing. I don't know. It's a lot to think about. But I don't I think it's like a one and the, I was reading it the uh in the light of the Ten Commandments being the royal law. And mm. uh, you gotta yep. get all ten checked off. Uh, good. You know, eight mm. won't work, nine won't work. You gotta gotta do all ten. Right. Yeah. And it's like a game, like you can't cheat on one rule and uh, and follow the others and be like I won and it's like well <laughs> there's that one that you didn't follow yeah you're just <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah I mean his language is sobering and um, you know I think he's just meant to wake people up and kind of shake them out of their you know I'm doing good enough that's enough. You know, like where is your focus? So. And I always wonder too, like, did he stand out in the streets and like shout this at people or did he <laughs> preach to communities or, you know, like how exactly did it work? You know, well, always talk better. about all this talk about meetings and synagogues. I, I'm guessing this this is intended for his congregation, you might say. Yeah. Or other congregations too, but you know, he's probably talking to his mostly. Then would he be welcome hey, in a synagogue? It, I don't know. It, did it say that this was in a letter form? Yeah. Okay. That's what this yeah, these are all letters, but not addressed to a specific congregation. Wasn't the James the leader of the church in Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, well, the Christian. He would be pretty welcome at, in mm -hmm. the, the um, Gentile Christian community, at least. Yeah. Yeah, I'm guessing he wasn't in synagogues, but I don't know. So, did he preach mainly to um, uh, Gentiles then? Um. Or yeah. The research I did, it's, it was Syrian Jewish slash Christian. <laughs> so, <laughs> so both. I mean, because, you know, Jesus had died. In that beginning piece, it said Messianic Jews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Messianic. Who he mostly, because he was in Jerusalem. He was in the Jewish section. But I think yeah. he did preach in synagogues. I don't know for sure. 
Good. Well, and the church is brand new. Like being a Christian was brand new. Well, yeah. I was reading that it probably meant that they had a messianic Jewish synagogue. That could be or, yeah. or congregation, and he was the leader of it. I mean, uh, yeah, Peter had been, but he uh, went off to do missionary work or whatever, and uh, James took over. But then it later gets wiped out by the uh, Romans in uh, whatever that was, 70 or whatever. So it, uh, that's why it's sort of, uh, in a way, a dead end, historically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this part, I, I could see a connection to him, 602, the royal law. Um, Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Um, it talks about neighbors are rich folk and poor, varied in color and race. Neighbors are nearby and far away. These are the ones we should serve. These are the ones we should love. All these are neighbors to us and you. So, hmm. I don't know that one. Oh, yes, you do. Do I? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I know that tune, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It, okay. It kind of works for James 3. I mean, James is a little repetitive, so. <laughs> Yeah. Let's see, let's stop sharing. We well, go. in mine it says at that at the very beginning where it says, for instance, when two visitors, mine says, two visitors may enter your place of worship. One is well dressed, the other not. But he just calls it your place of worship. And I would think okay. they would meet anywhere they could all get together. Yeah, mine just said meeting, and then it had a big old footnote. <laughs> so, yeah. Mine says that uh, it's Greek for this term is the origin of the English word synagogue. That's what my footnote says. Oh, great. Footnote says synagogue also. There you go. I was wondering about verse 7. It says, I think it's talking about the rich. Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? Do, do they mean Christian, Jesus? Is that the fair name by which these people have been called? The beloved? Yeah. I mean, that would make sense. Does anybody have a footnote? I'm not looking at a study Bible. At which, uh, which verse? Verse seven. Mm -hmm. The excellent name, that of Jesus Christ, okay. invoked at the at the time of baptism. That's what it says. <clears throat> yeah, mine says uh, the, those who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong. So that would okay. be Jesus. That yeah. makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let's finish it. Uh, someone read 14 to the end for us. I'll try if my voice is okay. <laughs> Take your time. Okay. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith 
without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his action were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Hmm. Yep. It's heavy. I feel like James just contradicted himself by saying Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So the belief was, but then he said he was justified by works. Mm. And not by faith alone. So that's kind of kind of a tangled oh yeah. well, I thought in 22 he says you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith mm. was brought to completion by the works. So to me, there's just this ongoing cycle of you have faith and it create it comes out in works because you love God and you love your neighbor. And then you have more faith and then you do more works and it's just a cycle. And another thing, it is not a chore. It is a privilege to oh. do the works. I think of it as not yep. just giving lip service to your faith, but also living it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In my footnote, it says, but James means only that righteous action is evidence of genuine faith. Not that it saves for the verse. Well, forget it. Oh. <laughs> the first part is what I was going to say. And it gets kind of weird down here. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense if you love your neighbor and you see them in distress, you're going to reach out to help. I mean, that's just, it's just authentic to what you believe that your deeds would follow, you know? Um, I just wanted to point out in verse 19, they're talking about there is one God. You believe there is one God. Um, but it's a declaration of monotheism. And it refers to Shema, um, which is one of the most important prayers in Judaism. And that's based on Deuteronomy 6, 4 in the Torah, uh, which is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So I thought it was, in, you know, of course, he's referencing the Torah and other things that Jewish community could connect with as he's um, preaching the word of Jesus it was a neat tie-in. Yeah. Yeah, the, the story of Abraham is interesting. And then in my Bible, it referred to Abraham as God's friend. Oh, that was me too. Yeah. Same here. Like that's a nice status. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I love that Rahab is the final example in this, you mm -hmm. know, and I, I think it sheds a lot of light because a lot of this sounds kind of judgy and ultra religious. And then you have a prostitute that believed in God and believed in his followers and did things like lie to the king and hide them and things that might be sins. Um, but here it, they were deeds that were inspired by faith. And so that brought about mercy for her, even if her way of life, we could see how that would be frowned upon. Um, I just love that it's this awesome, messy example of mm -hmm. someone who was doing a job to survive, but also had room in their heart to 
understand a higher power was calling on them to do a deed that would definitely severely impact the followers. And so um, that's why you can't get judgy about other people. You know, you don't know how they're serving the Lord in whatever space they take up in the world. There has to be room for that inspiration for the Holy Spirit to work through them. Uh, in my foot, I have a footnote that says Abraham and Rahab represent two extremes, the friend of God mm -hmm. and the harlot, but both. <laughs> yes, God. Yeah. Both did what, Susan? Were justified by God. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because mercy triumphs over judgment. There we go. <laughs> that <last> One liner. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have all these great one-liners now for <laughs> i remember for our good, for our good deeds <laughs> uh, so yeah that's the first uh couple chapters of james i did have one more hymn i guess if there's a few minutes i can try and pull it up um hymn 628 references kind of the end of james 2 here um to do these things and of course not helping me there we go I agree help us O Lord to learn the truths thy word imparts to study that thy laws may be inscribed upon our hearts and we definitely learned about the laws here Help us, O Lord, to live the faith which we proclaim, that all our thoughts and words and deeds may glorify thy name. Help us, O Lord, to teach the beauty of thy ways, that yearning souls may find the Christ and sing aloud his praise. Hmm. So. Hmm. It's interesting in my um, hymnal, the last line that says, find the Christ and live a life of praise. Perfect. Hmm. I like that better. Yeah, that's why this is the representative text. Because when you search a hymn in hymnary.org, it's like all hymns over all religions. And then you can narrow it down to the hymnal 1982 if you want. But yeah, it's kind of where we're at for the first couple chapters. And I, you know, I think that we hit upon the main themes of, you know, love your neighbor as yourself is the main law we're going for here. And how do you do that as a Christian in the world in a really real way um, is living out the deeds that, like Diane was saying, they, they're just a natural extension of the faith that you have into the world. So, yeah. The next week, I was thinking we just do chapters three and four. This seems like a decent pace if it's okay with you guys. Sure. Um, and I'll work on my sound issues. I don't, because I know Catherine shared those videos before through Zoom without a problem. So it's probably some weird setting. I just need to figure it out. I, I also could pull them up for you if need be, but maybe if you log in as host, that yeah. may make a difference. We'll see. Well, we can practice in between. There, there we go. Because <laughs> it'd be fun for you to hear the hymns just as a side. Yeah. So, yeah. And we hope to hear you play next week, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Congratulations on your reward, too. Oh, that was lovely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really, really happy for the quartet. They were, you know, we've worked hard. So it's fun to see. But thanks for making this first time very easy. I really <laughs> appreciate you. all your insights. Like, start. It's like good deeds. It's just so much better to do it all together. I enjoyed it. Yes. And it, right. It's good It's good to study some of the smaller books of the Bible that you just haven't had contact with before. Yeah. Like I said, I'm ashamed to admit, I didn't even know James was Jesus's half-brother or Jude. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I have marks in my Bible. We did it on 120, January of 20. Oh. Oh. With yeah, I got a lot of line underlined stuff in that, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's okay. So but I don't remember on. anything anyway. So I don't then... either. <laughs> I don't even remember we did it. <laughs> I don't either. Well, I wouldn't if it wasn't all marked up. Yeah. 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 yeah.